This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. This episode is sponsored by C-School, the online school for creativity training. If you'd like to unleash your creative potential and access a free creativity blueprint training series, then just head over to c.school. That's www.c.school for your free training series. In today's episode, I speak with Pete Williams, and we talk about the power of aggregation of marginal gains, photobombing, and the seven levers to double your profits. Enjoy this episode. Hey there, it's James Taylor, and I'm delighted today to be joined by Pete Williams. Pete Williams is an entrepreneur, business advisor, and marketer who Forbes recently called one entrepreneur today that every marketer should be modeling, while Inc. Uh, described him as a savvy marketing strategist. A Southern Region finalist in the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year program, a small business icon, best in class recipient, and an Australian Business Award winner for Marketing Excellent, he is the co-founder of numerous businesses across varying industries, from telecommunication services to e-commerce. Having been referred to as one as Australia's Richard Branson in media publications, Pete first made a name for himself when at the age of 21, he sold Australia's versions of Yankee Stadium, the Melbourne Cricket Ground, for under $500. There's definitely a story there. Uh, Pete is also a professor of, of practice at Deakin University, Australia, and his new book, Cadence, which I have a copy of here, A Tale of Fast Business Growth, is out now. It's my great pleasure to have Pete with us on the show. So welcome, Pete. I appreciate it. I'm uh, I'm a little nervous after that intro. I've got to make <laughs> sure I uh, say something of value because uh, that was... Uh, Thank you very much for that. Well, so share with everyone. Obviously, you've got you've got the book uh, that's just yes. come out. Has this just completely taken over your life, or uh, for the past few months? Is that is that is that your big focus? Yeah, it literally has been. You know, the book's probably been almost three years in the making. Really, I think got signed the deal about two and a half, three years ago. And obviously, the the writing process you, you keep stretching the timelines from the publisher and pushing it back and pushing it back. And then you know, obviously, once it's done, it's just yet yeah, focus on launch, and that's what's sort of really been the last two or three months has just been that intense focus on trying to you know get the word out there and hopefully help as many people as we can with the message so there's three reasons i I really like this book first of all it's it's not one of these massive tomes that you have to like take weeks (laughs) to read it's a really quick read and it's a really far i mean it's just really punchy it's got it's it's well edited it's well put together so you don't you you your team done a great job there the second reason um if you're into cycling uh like myself you're gonna love this book because uh (laughs) it's there's there's a strong cycling narrative and the third reason is if you like books like the e-myth revisited uh, by michael e gerber this is a this is a good one because you you share a similar kind of narrative form in it it's you use mm-hmm. this kind of parable of this of the these two characters uh in the book to really tell a much bigger story and a kind of strategy as well so was that was that was the e-myth was that kind of key one that you kind of looked to uh in terms of like when you were thinking about the structure of your book because obviously so many business yeah. books are coming all out all the time and unfortunately most of them are yeah. really boring Yes, absolutely. Well, I think you're right. I think Emith was definitely a uh, inspiration to a certain extent for the type of book we put together. Uh, it was recently someone said to me it was like the sequel to the Emith, which was such a really cool um, thing for someone to say. But it didn't start out like that. You know, two and a half years ago, when we signed the deal with the publishers, it was a traditional nonfiction book. It was that call it bland, lean in startup kind of feel to it and I got you know into it and I was just like this is not really engaging enough I wasn't really enjoying it and I was the one writing the damn thing so pivoted went back and said okay let's let's make this into a story and it's based on a true story as well which sort of helps sort of make it come through and really give that punchy nature to it because it was based on a number of conversations I had with someone and I one of my favorite business books of all time is a book called Built to Sell by John Willow. Yeah, it's a fantastic book. book. Um, so I was able to track down the editor that worked with John on that book and uh, and got her to help out with this one, which was, uh, was really, really handy because I'm not a writer by trade. Like, I own telco companies here in Australia and I'm in the trenches like running businesses. I'm not an author by trade. I'm not a, a speaker or anything like that by trade. So I really needed someone to help me actually make it engaging. Uh, so I was, you know, wrote all the conversations because they, you know, happened and it's sort of what we do. 
Uh, but then someone came in and really made it the engaging story with the characters and the narrative and, and all that sort of stuff. And it's uh, I'm really happy with how it's come out. So it kind of really centers around uh, this story of uh, of, a, of a guy who has a, uh, he has a kind of a shop, bike, bike shop, kind of, uh, kind mm-hmm. of health and fitness type shop who um, is really good at what he does, very good kind of coach, personal trainer. But uh, he's not necessarily good at building his business, and I think I think so many business owners will will read this book, and they'll especially if you've been in business for a few years, and your business you, 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 it's kind of gone past the excitement stage, and uh, and you're now <laughs> in the stage where you're a little bit in the trenches uh, with it as well. So I think this book is going to be good. But you talk about something called um, aggregation of marginal gains, mm-hmm. which obviously comes from the cycling world, like uh, uh, Team Sky. Uh, yes. kind of, that kind of came. So I- explain what that is, that concept is, and how it applies really to business. Yeah, well, it's, it's a great story that um, when I've gone completely blank on his name, the guy who's the, the head of Team Sky, uh, David, I've gone completely blank. Um, I should know this by now. But basically the story is when he took over Team Sky, the, the British cycling team hadn't won races or anything of any note for, for a number of years. So he came in and said, okay, we're going to go – beyond just bike we're going we're going to think about what other things can actually help create a winning culture and a winning team and it's what he terms as you said marginal gains and it was all about doing the one percenters so things like he would uh when research the best pillow for the team to sleep on during their various tour de france's and um all those different races the best way to wash your hands to make sure you don't get sick like he went to the nth degree of little one percent wins that were going to add up to massive differences in the team and you know if you're a cycling fan you'd known that you know obviously team sky have just dominated the tour de france and all the big multi-stage races for the last sort of five six seven years they've done a massive shift uh, in in the turnaround from this concept of marginal gains that it doesn't take necessarily big things to have massive results it's just small things compound into great results and it's the same sort of business framework that we've used in our companies and is what is kind of the, the story of the uh, of, of cadence. And it's funny, I, as I was doing it, I was going through the book and it, it really talks about this idea about how to double your profits in, in, in mm-hmm. your business. So regardless of whatever kind of business you have, you could be a keynote speaker, you could have a make, uh, maybe a very entrepreneurial type of business, you could be a coaching business, whatever yeah. the business is, it doesn't really matter. But it's like how really. to double your profits. And you, in the book, it talks about this just 10% uh, marginal gain across these seven different areas, these seven different mm. levers in the business, and I had—I must admit—I had to sit and do the maths because I thought ten percent that doesn't add up to like doubling your business, surely. And I sat and did the yeah. maths, and I'm like, oh, oh, okay, no, that does work. That does <laughs> that, that, that does work out. So, um, you, you one of the, the 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 key parts in it as well is you you really push home this this differentiation between strategy and tactics. Um, yes. Obviously, you know the bright shiny, shiny thing. The marketers get you know some new tactic, new hack gets talked about all the time, and you really lay it. You kind of you know your one of your characters in, in the book really says like tactics. I mean they're great and everything, but it's the strategy. It's focus focus on the yes. on the strategy as well. Tactics are below the belt, and strategies are above the shoulders. <laughs> you can figure out that one a little bit more. <laughs> so what was was there a particular mentor that you had that really kind of drilled that idea into you that is really strategy that you should be thinking about? Yeah, I think there's been a combination of a lot of people, direct mentors and, and consultants and coaches that we've worked with, and also just a lot of just reading and, and fumbling through stuff in that, you know, we realize that, you know, the problem with a lot of what's being spoken about in the business world these days and what's being preached and screamed on social media is use this tactic, use this social media platform, you've got to run webinars, like it's always tactic stuff they're screaming about. And, you know, those tactics work. There's no question that tactics are good. You need tactics. You need to implement tactics to win. But if you don't have a strategy for those tactics to sit within, you struggle. And you end up just running around in circles. You know, we see this all the time is that, you know, if we go back to the E-Myth and, and what Michael spoke about in the E-Myth, he did a really good job of getting people to realize there's a difference between being, you know, on the tools, working in your business under the hood versus working on your business. Yeah. And he really gave that really great distinction. Yet where he seemed to leave people hanging, in my opinion, is he didn't then say, okay, when you are spending that time working on your business, you've scheduled out Monday afternoons my on my business time. I'm going to get off the tools. I'm going to work on my business. Well, what are you going to do? What's the roadmap? What's your strategy? What's your framework for that particular 
on my business time. And that kind of led people to sort of think, okay, I've got to work on my business, not on the tools. Well, I'm just going to chase tactics. And that, I think, was a, a, a good shift in the on versus in decision, but still left people really lost of what to actually do. And that's where strategy comes in. Because if you have a strategy or a framework, it gives you that guidance of, okay, this week when I'm going to work on my business, this is the strategy I'm trying to implement. This is the goal I'm working towards. And then you go and find the tactic that fits that issue and not the other way around. Whereas too many people go tactic first hmm. and they end up going, well, hang on, I've got this webinar software. I'm trying to use social media. I'm, I'm trying to write a sales letter. Or I'm using lead pages to create opt-ins. It's like, well, hang on, you're a dentist. Do you really need an opt-in form for a dentist? And too many people are starting to sort of stick their business into these tactics that just don't work. And you wonder why you've spent all this time trying to build this massive you know, internet marketing lead funnel thing for your, your dentist or your landscape gardener. It's like, really? Do you really need to give people an opt-in form and a, and a lead magnet to, to get them to mow your lawn? Like it's just – it, it's really a problem that I see so often. And you, in in the in the book, you lay out this kind of framework, these kind of seven levers, mm-hmm. the th- seven things actually make a difference to to businesses. Um, and and then one that you then talk about the book is obviously it's, those levers are going to be kind of different for different types of businesses. Whether whether yep. a dentist is going to be different from if you're like doing some online kind of uh, product, for example. Yeah. Yep, you're a SaaS or something. Absolutely. Yeah, if you're SaaS, and, and and one of the things I, I I guess that you must get a lot is you know one of the very first parts you talk about is this idea one leaves the suspects, you know, bringing people mm-hmm. in the very top of your funnel. But what I thought was yeah. interesting about the book is that one of the characters in the book says actually that's often not always the best place to start. The best place to start is talking about the low hanging fruit, which can sometimes yes. feel like the unsex, it's like unsexy thing. Cause everyone says, I oh, need yeah. more people in the door. I need more people in the door. That's I, need more, I, need more, I need more leads. I need more leads. I need more. But so that was obviously, that was quite a key part of the book is really talking about finding the, finding the, the, the low hanging fruit in your business yep. to get those, some of those quick wins. Mm, I, I think, you know, it's probably worth defining these seven levers. And yes, kind of we're giving away the secret sauce and part of the book, but it's all about this movement and helping people really. I don't really care about selling the books, but please buy it. Um, so the seven things, this is the thing, no matter what business you are, you know, we discovered in our business very early on when we hit a ceiling in terms of our growth and we sat back and went, okay, well, what is driving the profit in our business? What is it that actually is the the, the drivers of, of, of the, the, this revenue and the, and the net profit we were keeping? And we realized there were seven things, and then we were able to map that into other business groups that we had. So there's suspects, as you said. You know, they're the people who come into your store, visit your website, whatever it might be. Then the next distinction a lot of people don't make is the next real lever is prospects. What percentage of those suspects put up their hand and show you that they're seriously interested in buying from you? So they might be coming into your uh, retail clothing store and going into the change rooms and trying on a dress. They may have downloaded your free opt-in report if that sort of does fit with your business strategy. They've called you up to get a free quote for um, the landscaping you're going to do, whatever it might be. So there's a real distinction between suspects and prospects that a lot of people don't make. They just call them leads. And I think that's a massive issue from a marketing communication perspective. Then you've got your conversions. What percentage of those people actually open up their wallet and give you their credit card? So there's your first three. Then you've got your average items um, out of average item price, what's the price of the average stuff you sell? What's your items per sale? You know, how many t- things are people putting in their shopping cart when they are purchasing from you? Then you've got your transactions. How often do they come back and buy again? And then finally, you've got your margins. Now, there are your seven things. And like I'm sure to most people, that's not overly revolutionary. It's not like, wow, you've just rained down wisdom from the sky. Yet, I don't know many people actually take the time to, one, sit down and actually clarify what each of those seven things are in their business. Not many people calculate what their actual results are. And then as you said before, 10% wins. If you just increase each of those areas by just 10%, you increase your conversion rate from 20% to 22%. You increase your average items per sale from 1.3 to 1.43. Like tiny, small, marginal gains as we spoke about, the compounding effect is the doubling of your business. So that's how the framework works. It's about giving you freedom to have success in small bite-sized chunks and not feeling like, oh, hang on, I tried this tactic and I didn't get 10,000 new email subscribers in 11 days, like the sales letter said I would. I'm a failure. Well, you know, if you've got a 10% boost, you've done pretty well. So once you kind of identify that framework to go back to, to your point is 
yeah, everyone's like, give me the good leads. Give me the good suspects. I need more suspects. Well, you know, a 10% boost in suspects will give you the exact same bottom line difference as a 10% boost in transactions per customer or a 10% boost in conversion rates. Yeah. So for a lot of businesses, you've got, you're already getting customers in the door. Well, what are you doing to encourage your team to ask, would you like fries with that? Like it's an overused cliche, but it's important. What are you doing in an automated, systemated sense to get people to come back and buy from you again? And by taking the time to sort of identify what those seven levers are in your business, you often find there's a massive low-hanging fruit. Oh, look, it's embarrassing to say I forgot that that AdWords campaign we created has been paused for six weeks. Like, we've done that in our business. Like, oh, you know, I forgot my credit card expired and MailChimp hasn't been sending out, you know, reminder emails to customers for six weeks. Or, uh, you know, we the staff have stopped asking, would you like fries with that because I'm not monitoring it. And there's some massive small wins or quick wins you can have that will actually make shifts in your business without having to worry about giving me the good leads. And I, th- I think what's great about that as well, you know, many of our viewers, listeners who are probably would describe themselves as creative professionals, creative entrepreneurs. Yep. And sometimes business can feel like, like the, the okay, the, the numbers and things. But <laughs> but actually, what I, what I love about this is if, if you kind of truly go into it with a sense of curiosity and like, mm. like a mad scientist, like experimenting, how can I get that number? And just like, just going into using your, your human creativity to like, okay, how can I change that? How can I get that number to go from there to there? What? And then, then you do obviously get into the Absolutely. word of tactics. And then you can go, oh, well, yeah. I wonder if that... And I think the other thing you, you can have allude to a little bit on the book is around masterminds. And I think this is where also the power of masterminds, if you have a mastermind mm-hmm. of other people who are maybe maybe in a similar industry to you, is then you can benchmark your those those kind of numbers uh you know what yes. those conversion rates are and then i had a conversation the other day with another uh, keynote speaker who's one great speaker hall of fame speaker and he said to me so what's your conversions on your you know what we call a discovery call taking someone on a yep. discovery call to them actually booking me to come and speak and i and i was really proud i said well it's, it's like like 80 percent or something and he said you're not charging enough <laughs> that, that was, and I felt quite deflated by that. Yeah. And he said, "You want you want to get like a, a conversion rate of twenty five percent." He said, "Because your you, you would say your 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 uh, um, revenue per sale, yeah, it is you need to get that much higher because you have a limited amount of dates because you're a limited time. Yep. So you're trying to get that up. It's not right. necessarily right. about the conversions." And then you start getting really curious of like, okay, well, what can I do to change that number? So there's actually a lot of creativity you can start putting love into it. it. That perspective, that question of like, no, you want a lower conversion rate. I, I love that example. I'm going to use that, man, because that is a really, really good framework or really good frame or vision to look through because you're right, you know. And I think what you were saying before about the creativity element is that the thing that I personally love about using the framework in our businesses is the way we do it is mixing the – creativity with that advisory board mastermind scenario. So what we do is we pull together all our team leaders every every month and we have our advisory board session. Well, what we do is we sit down and we go, okay, this month we're going to work on this lever in our business, improving transactions per customer, getting people to come back more, hypothetically. And we'll get all the team in from the different business divisions and say, okay, let's brainstorm, let's get creative in a group setting of how do we each get a 10% boost in our transactions per customer? And we get that creativity within the the construct of the framework. Yeah. I think, you know, a lot of people say like, "I'm not creative. I'm not a I'm not a painter. I'm not you know anything like that." Yet I think a, what I hear a lot from creators and musicians and painters and writers is they're they're most creative when they're actually within a positive constraint of some form. I have I've only got half an hour, or here is my blank canvas. I've got to fill this out. I've got to write a hundred words before I can leave my desk or whatever it might be. And I think this, for business owners, this framework takes it away from tactics and gives you that forced creativity window to actually really be creative with how do I get my 10% win? What is the creative thing I can do and implement to get this boost? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and how you can steal from different industries. You know, I was talking to someone today um, that I thought was brilliant is that the um, – the drive-through that you know McDonald's and KFC and all those fast food chains are you know really really famous for, that actually came from banks. Apparently in the US they had drive-through banks years before they had drive-through takeout fast food industry, 
And I was like, that's really weird because you'd think banking industry is the last industry you'd ever steal some sort of creative <laughs> idea from. And I thought that was such a brilliant example of you know the power of mastermind groups and thinking outside your own square of how do I get ideas to boost conversions, traffic, suspects, mm. transactions, even margins. Like, How can you get creative with negotiating to get better margins with your suppliers? That last one, the margins, I, that's probably the, unse- let's, this may be the unsexiest of the levers um, <laughs> yes. uh, because no one really wants to sit and go through probably their costs and work out, like, how can I get... And I, I was t- I was uh, working at doing an event in, in Italy recently for a very large company to make uh, tractor tires, to make all over the world tractor right. tires. And if you go into... If you go into a fa- uh, an Amazon warehouse, those little tires on the vehicles that are moving around, this, this yep. company makes this. But they have a big cost. They have a big cost because it's, uh, you basically cook tires, which I never really knew okay. the tires. And so energy costs are a major, major thing. So for mm. them, of those seven levers, the bi- the one that makes the biggest difference is those margins. And they, we were kind of yep. working. I was helping them kind of get very creative in terms of brainstorming ideas. So it doesn't always have to be at the top of the funnel bringing those yes. those suspects and prospects. You can get a, you can work from the other way. Um, as you've been building your own business, you've built a, a series of businesses. Can you tell me about a time where you worked on a, a project, a business, um, and you were giving it your heart and your soul, but for whatever reason, it didn't go the way that you wanted? And more importantly, what were the lessons that you took from that experience? I can tell you many a story of failed stupidity. We've been in business for 14 years, so I've got plenty of examples. Um, look, ironically, the one that kind of comes to mind actually was somewhat of the genesis for the whole framework we now use. This is when we started our business. We like I'm, we, we're in the telco space. The majority of the companies in our group are in the telecommunication space. Uh, but myself, my business partners, we're not technicians we're not telco people from experience we came into the business because we saw a gap in the market you know 13 14 years ago it's when you know the office manager who's given the task to go and get some quotes for a new phone system began to use google rather than the yellow pages that was their their new go-to sort of source for looking for i need a phone system we realized that no one in the market was really doing that really well so we just went and just positioned ourselves right there where people were looking and, and it was phenomenal for us. We were a sales and marketing company that happened to sell phone systems and we'd outsource the actual installation. And we thought we were getting really creative and that like, look, we're not getting our hands dirty, we're generating the lead, we're making the sale and then effectively giving uh, the installation to a subcontractor. And we were all beating our chest going, how great are we? We've got this business model where we don't have to worry about the implementation, uh, we get paid before we have to deliver, it was great. But what we soon realized was we put a glass ceiling on ourselves very, very quickly because what we realized was, well, let me ask you, if you bought a phone system from someone, James, and you needed to buy extra handsets or get some support six months down the track, who are you going to call? The people who actually just sold you it and then handballed you to someone else or the person who turned up, installed it, trained you, yeah. programmed it? You know, Of course, you're going to go back to that actual person was there with their gloves their their white gloves on giving you the experience you won the inside track yeah so we just had no repeat business because we were literally just passing our our sales to our uh, competitors effectively and uh as much as we thought we were getting creative we went yeah that wasn't the smartest move uh so from that is when we sat down and went okay what is driving business or the profit in our business what is the the drivers and what are the drivers in other businesses? What are the areas that drive profit that we're not looking at? And that's where we kind of started to get really clear about, oh, yeah, transactions per customer, repeat business. That's a big driver. We better think about that. And even just things like, hey, what are we doing to increase our average items per sale? Like we were just selling the phone system. And then from there, we started an e-commerce business, uh, simply headsets, to sell headsets, um, not only directly, but also as to complement the phone system as a, another item we could sell. And that business now is a multi-million dollar e-commerce business in its own right. So from some of these problems we had of almost creativity, but lack of creativity or lack of vision, grew some really cool stuff for us. And you mentioned John Morillo earlier on there. I think his yep. one of his latest books is called Subscription or Subscriptions or something around in terms of... Uh... Customer, I've gone blank, the customer... Oh, yeah, it's about repeats. It's basically about, about repeat. It was, and and that that kind of really goes directly to one of those triggers that you were mentioning there about how to increase, you know, the, the you know the items per sale or, or the length of the customer that you know those repeat. And so there's there's you know there's individual things you can pull from those areas. What about um as you were building these businesses and obviously now with with this book as well, was there a key 
aha moment, a key moment when you went, oh, okay, this is the direction I want to go with my life and my business as an entrepreneur. This is this is the kind, this is kind of uh, the value that I want to put out into the world. Yeah, look, I, I think you know we had success in our businesses. We sort of loosely had this framework, and then we kind of just began to talk about it, you know, because. My mum's a math teacher, so I think there's some teaching in the in the vein. So I think for me, it was about wanting to help other people uh, avoid the struggle that we had, and I realised there was, in my opinion, some stuff missing with what most gurus are out there saying. So you know, I'm still in my business three days a week at least, you know, running the business, make managing the team, all that sort of stuff. So I'm in the trenches, and I'll, I'll never get out of that. You know, I always find find it odd in certain circumstances. A lot of you know business coaches and gurus are preaching something, but not not actually doing it. Yeah. I'm like, well, you know, if you're a business coach and you're preaching leverage and systems and all you're doing is selling your time for money, it's like, well, hang on, that's a bit incongruent. Whereas, you know, to me, it's like I'm never going to have as much revenue from a consulting business as I do from the telco. It's just technically impossible. So uh, that to me was an aha moment to go, yeah, look, I want to help people, but I'm not going to go and jump ship completely into being a full-time consultant because it just – yeah, it doesn't have that foundation that the, the, the telco gives me. One of the things you, a little, this is something I thought was interesting just from a writing standpoint uh, in the book uh, was that you, there's a part in the book where you kind of you go through almost like different avatars uh, of different mm-hmm. companies, different types of people that have in, in, implemented these seven levers in their business. Yep. And the reason I thought that was such a, a really cool little piece is because that's something I see Robert Greene, the writer of books like Mastery do. He, he yep. said he always, um, uh, he was talking uh, with, uh, with another writer and he said, whenever you write your books, especially in nonfiction, always use different types of stories, different types of characters in your book. Mm-hmm. So, and the reason for that is even if the person that's reading can't see themselves in one of those characters, often they will see, oh, that's just like Sue. I'm gonna I'm gonna recommend this book to Sue because Sue is a <laughs> yoga teacher and yep. struggling to. Or you know, John has this engineering company. So I actually thought that was yep. that was quite a nice little. I don't know if that was how conscious that was for yourself and your editor, but but it was actually it was very good. I think it is, is is a way to just kind of spread your message and get other people kind of word of mouth. I thought it was a nice little touch. Yeah. Appreciate that. Unfortunately, I can't take credit for that being a conscious choice. The, the reason we did that, there was a conscious reason we did that, but it wasn't for the pass along value. The, the 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 issue I always had in the back of my mind with the book is that because it's a parable and it's set in a retail bike store, my concern was that people would pigeonhole it as a retail book and wouldn't necessarily apply it to Silicon Valley sasses or white collar business. Uh, and that was a concern for me being the way the book was written. Mm. So try to sort of tell tales of different examples all the way through. So if someone was a graphic designer or a lawyer or ran a computer store or was an e-commerce provider, whatever it might have been, they could see, oh, okay, I can see how this applies to me. Okay, I will really embrace this more as opposed to thinking, oh, I'm enjoying this book and then not really seeing themselves in it because they're not a retailer. Yeah. That, that was the reason we did that and that, there was a very conscious decision of that. Uh, I never had thought about the reason for the pass along value, so I, uh, I'll, I'll take that as yeah. I was really trying to embed transactions per customer and referrals <laughs> in the book. Yeah, that was the, the other thing I thought as well. It's I'm gonna obviously I'm gonna I have a local bike store here near where I live, and I'm gonna recommend this book to the the owner of the store. Um, but one of the and I actually I thought you know strategy is is or tactic really is uh, can you get these copies in in bike stores because mm-hmm. as, as i look around let's you talk about this idea of the mammals you know middle-aged men in yep. lycra and, <laughs> it's and the new I, golf you know it's, it's, it's like new golf and i also see a lot of women you know my wife's a cyclist as well uh, but yep. they all many of them own businesses many of them yes. are senior you know executives and companies and actually they're almost like your ideal reader for this book yep. as well so I, i'm wondering if there's a there's a distribution strategy through going yeah. through bike stores as well there yeah i think that was like that was a conscious decision is like one of the reasons although it's based on a true story like when i was doing my first iron man the bike store literally across the road from my telco office um was where i bought my bike and the coach helped me through my iron man and i helped him with his business so as much as it was based on a true story when i hit that sort of creative roadblock with the actual book itself when it was that traditional nonfiction book and i started thinking this is not going where i want it to go how do i write this in a different way the the thinking that yeah cycling is the new golf is what business owners and people do now more so than golf so that was a bit of a yeah i'm going to jump onto that and really use this story as the 
the underlying current of the story in the book for that pure reason. Um, and in terms of getting into bike stores, talking to a couple of um, like manufacturer, like bike brands mm -hmm. to say, you know, look, rather than, you know, producing brands umbrellas and drink bottles and stuff to gift out to your, 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 your stores and your accounts, why not, you know, co-brand the book and go, hey, we sell X brand bike. Mr. Bikes Runner, here's a gift to you that actually helps you grow your business yeah. and sell more bikes. Yeah. In turn, move more of my product. So it's a less self-serving branded gift than um, than that. And so we're talking to some bike brands yeah. about that to do that and other retail manufacturers as well just to sort of say, if you sell to retailers, here's a great gift that you can give. It's you know, 15 bucks, buy it at wholesale, it's probably 10. And you can co-brand it and it's much better than an umbrella or a or a, a drink bottle or a whatever else, polo shirt, all that sort of other crap that a lot of promotional companies <laughs> sell. It's like, well, if I'm a bike runner, do I really want another polo shirt with a bike brand on it or would I prefer something that's going to help me grow my business? So that's some of the creative stuff we're doing. If anyone's listening and watching to this just now and you are in that situation, we're going to have links here at the end so you can get <laughs> uh, you can you can get in contact with Peter to follow yeah, up absolutely. on that. Actually, it reminds me, there's a friend of mine, Frank Furness, who's a South African speaker, but he lives in, in uh, the UK. And he one of his biggest clients is one of the companies that makes all the, the running machines and gyms. I can't remember. Oh, one yeah, the of, treadmills and stuff. One, yeah. the tread, one of the big treadmill companies. And he goes and he probably speaks like 20 times a year at all these huge conferences. And they, as the company, they bring him in because yep. he, uh, and for exactly that reason, they, they don't want just, you know, gifts and other things all the time. But actually to have someone go in there, they, 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 there's a company, they can bring that speaker in to really add value as a keynote speaker at that Beautiful. conference to help each of those gym owners build their businesses. And of course, right. everyone gets a copy of the book uh as well it's, it's just a nice it's a, it's, a, it's a nice so any of my keynote speaker friends watching or listening to this just now as well there's another little that's another little bit of a tactic there to to increase yeah. one of your your numbers um as we start to finish really? up here i do notice you're not completely impartial to some fun tactics uh i was following <laughs> you on i think it's instagram or twitter and you've been uh, doing some Insta. pretty cool photobombing recently. <laughs> yes. Uh, so describe what that's all about. Oh, look, just, you know, I'm not a big social guy. We don't use it in our business. You know, we're B2B. Our audience is not on social. So I've never really been a big social guy. I like to stalk people but never really posted. So we thought, well, we're going to do some social stuff leading up to the book, create some buzz, create some followers, create some PR opportunities. We decided to do some really cool um, Photoshop stuff. So basically just – trawled a whole bunch of um not trolled but trawled through a whole bunch of um friends um people i know famous people's insta and grabbed photos and then basically went to a, a photo studio and just did a whole bunch of photoshop stuff of me wrestling the rock and <laughs> me um sitting in neil strauss's palm and um a whole bunch of business people stuff so it's been a lot of fun and you know been something different and trying to see if we can leverage that into some exposure to, to gain followers because it's a bit hard to to cut through the noise these days yeah. and it's, it was a bit of creative fun so haven't quite cracked the nut i did wonder if you if you got a comment from brenda bashard about being in a shower though i did see yeah. that one <laughs> <laughs> well that was a, that was a tim ferris one the tim ferris one was the oh, shower tim one. Ferris one that was a, that brendan was, a was um i was uh photo bombing his christmas tree for christmas in july so, yeah, it's been a bit of fun. Wonderful. And we'll put those links so you can people check that out as well. As yeah, we start awesome. to finish up here, uh, just kind of, kind of final questions for you. Um, is there an online resource or an online tool or an app that you find really useful for the work that you do as, a, as an entrepreneur? Yeah. Oh, look, I'd say Dropbox for me. I'm addicted to Dropbox. We use that heaps in our business. I uh, started to use Slack a little bit, which has been good. But I think Dropbox is the key. Um, One Password in the telco, we've rolled that out only recently in the telco group because, you know, People using different platforms are quite across the business now. So one password has been really handy for just streamlining that sort of stuff. So there's a couple of stuff that, that we use quite a bit in our companies. And you mentioned a couple of books already, but if there was one book that you'd recommend to people, maybe a good a com accompanying book to this, uh, to Cadence, what would that book be? Uh, can I give you two? Yeah, go for it. Uh, I'll, give, I'll give you my favorite book of all time, which is My Life in Advertising <laughs> by Claude Hopkins. Yeah. It's from 1923, so it's an old book. But I, I really do think it's probably one of the best business books ever written. And my second favorite book from this year, I have to say my first, my own book's the first book, don't I? But my second favorite book from this year is a book called Never Lose a Customer Again by Joey Coleman. It is a brilliant book about customer retention and customer experience. And I don't think it's getting enough love out there. Um, 
I don't know Joey, so I'm not pimping him because I, I know him or he's a friend. I just really enjoy the book, and I've I've bought a bunch of copies of that this year to give to clients and friends and stuff like that. So they're, they're my two must-read books of the moment after Cadence. I don't know Joey personally, but I've got a couple of we've got a, a kind of mutual uh, contacts, mutual friends, and I know he, he was recently speaking, a great keynote speaker. He was speaking at a conference yep. recently. Uh, I think it was Social Media World or one of these ones in, in San Diego. Uh, and he was talking about the first hundred days, I think, of yes. onboarding a customer. And that was That's like, a stick. and yeah. a friend of mine went. He said it just it's completely transformed what they're doing with their business in terms of awesome. uh, you know never losing a losing a customer again. Mm-hmm. Um, what about an album? Is there? I know you're big into like triathlons. Is is there music that kind of I'm, gets your heart pacing? I'm a massive Kanye West fan. I just love Kanye. Yeah, he's a bit out there with some of his comments, but the self confidence, the bravado. Uh, you put that aside he's just an awesome musician so um yeah kanye's a, I'm a big fan and john mayer too I, I like the guys with big egos for some reason i'm not sure, quite <laughs> sure why but uh, that seems to come through in the music that i like i don't really i've never really listened much to kanye's stuff but if there was one album to get started on what would the album be uh look college dropout his first one i love his first album i really think college dropout is it's quintessential kanye for me uh, I, I would love him to go back to that sort of style of lyrical genius but uh you know, he's getting a little bit darker in his old age and a bit more cynical. But yeah, college dropout. And I want you to imagine now you um, you woke up tomorrow morning and you have to start mm-hmm. from scratch. So you've got all the skills, all the knowledge you've acquired over the years, but no one knows you. You know no one. You have to restart your career, your business. What would you do? How would you restart? I would probably do one of two things. I would start a blog and just do no, basically do spec work unrequested um, and just go out there and go, if I was this business, this is what I would do. If I was this business, this is what I would do and just write content or design adverts or do what it is that I do for free as if I was working for that client. Um, I think that's an undervalued, underutilized way to, to, to cut through the noise if you are just starting out. So I just go, okay, who's the type of clients I want to work with? Well, let's pretend I already am and just be very transparent about my ideas and my suggestions and, and leave that out on the table because I think that would drive inquiry and, and business from that scenario. The other thing I'd probably do is for me, I would go to startup pitch events and find, and just listen to the pitches uh, of people who have a great idea who can't articulate or necessarily know how to market their business and have good products. And I'd do a similar sort of thing, just write them afterwards and go, hey, Bill, I was at this event, I heard you speak, I love your idea, this is what I would do. If you're looking for a partner to help with the marketing and the the strategy stuff, I'd love to get involved, here is what I'd suggest. And just do that, because like my skill set is not in tech, it's not in the product development, it's, it's in marketing, it's framing, positioning, strategy stuff. So I would need someone with a business idea, essentially, that I can go in cold to and go, look, I can add value here. So they're probably my two things. It's really just, yeah, Give examples on proof of what you do in a transparent way, and that will generate stuff afterwards. Now, if people want to get their copy of the book, learn about the book, and also maybe to reach out to you to connect with you, what's the best place for them to go and do that? Yeah, probably cadencebook.com is probably the, the best place to, to, to see me, unless you want to buy a phone system, really. Cadencebook is the place to go. Cadencebook.com, uh, you can pick up a copy there, all good bookstores, the usual song and dance that that authors do but um yeah there's a forms on there if you want to reach out for any reason reach out love to chat and connect and help anybody any way we can well pete it's a great read cadence a tale of fast business growth is out now i highly recommend it uh, thank you pete so much for coming on and sharing the story of your creative life right james appreciate it, it was great fun and i hope uh, the audience got some value If you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high-performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.